Marshall and Sagar here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Everyone, welcome to Sagar and my year in review discussion episode, kicking off the month of realignment coverage, where we're just going to do this final big discussion episode of the year going through the themes that we've covered. Let's start with something very obvious, Sagar. I would love to get your thoughts on the China COVID protests that are <laughs> developing, emerging. We don't really have any sense of what's going on right now. I did this really interesting episode with uh, Frank Decutter. He wrote the People's Tr Trilogy on Mao. He's based in Hong Kong. And he pointed out that this is the first time since really the 1950s that there basically is just near zero Western, even foreign press coverage in China right now. So we uh, don't really know what's happening. So with that said, like, let's get your theory on this. I'm glad that you, that's actually my only takeaway. I have no idea. It's one of those, it's so difficult because all that's coming out to us is uh, urban areas, Xinjiang, Urimki, Shanghai, Beijing. What's going on in the village? No clue. It's one of those things where I could see it both ways. I could see the villagers being totally bought in because they have no access to the Western press. They're heavily censored. Uh, Chinese social media, and they could just be going along with it. I've seen some theories, though, that some of the biggest dissent could be coming from there. And my favorite theory is that uh, by watching the World Cup, the Chinese population realized that the entire world no longer is wearing masks and is gathering in large places and not living in uh, global lockdown. That said, I'm, it sounds a little too cute to believe. So I think we should just analyze it on what do we know? We know that there are protests in urban areas. And actually, then maybe that's all we need because the CCP are genuinely so paranoid, and especially whenever the West is watching, that they will treat it as an existential threat, whether it is or not. That happened in Hong Kong. That happened in Tiananmen. Uh, Xi, I've read a lot about Xi and his impressions of Tiananmen. He and his family suffered a lot during the Cultural Revolution, and he in particular looks at universities as like hotbeds of, quote, chaos. And like anytime he sees students uh, protesting, complete freak out. So uh, unfortunately, I predict there will be a violent crackdown um, and we will see. I mean, you're already seeing it like the police, the way that the, the security state there. It is so dystopian, it's difficult to believe. I posted stuff on my Instagram of like police drones flying around apartment buildings, being like, stay in your homes or we will arrest you. There's a decent uh, thread, let me find this, which is really good, from a Washington Post reporter who's actually in Beijing, which talks about how extensive and uh, how much of a dragnet the surveillance state in China is. It's like, oh, you think you can wear a mask to go to a protest? No. Their facial recognition software is so good that they have 90 days worth of storage. And based literally upon the shape of your eyes, it's good enough that they, in court and in criminal proceedings, they have uh, identified you. you. Even if you wear sunglasses and a mask, they could still find you. Quote, I've seen thousands of procurements describing Chinese surveillance systems over the years that are able to recognize despite face coverings and whether you have a, quote, yellow, white, black, or brown race face in their... Uh, parlance. Anyway, zero COVID. This is why I don't think zero COVID has anything to do with COVID. I mean, I think Xi and the current CCP is freaking out because GDP is going down and they have historic inflation. The first time really that GDP is not skyrocketing since 1976. I just have no idea. That's a violation of the social contract they made with the Chinese people, especially in the Deng Xiaoping era. And they're just going to do what they do best, which is control. So I don't think it has anything to do with COVID. I think it has to do with a natural expansion of the surveillance state compared with 21st century technology. What do you think? Yeah, that's that's all good. I, I do actually think, though, to a certain degree, zero COVID has to do with COVID, quote unquote, at a kind of grander, almost narrative level. Mm. You know, when you, in your personal life, in your professional life, you get obsessed with this metric that in one specific context really matters, and then you take it too far and it just ends yeah. up harming you. Mm -hmm. So I got into this during the Ukraine daily series back in February. I was like, oh shit, Marshall, you're doing like these daily episodes and like your ability to do a daily episode on this pressing issues, what distinguishes you as a mm -hmm. podcaster and you keep going and you keep going. And I eventually had to just wake myself up and say, dude, yeah. 
stop right. doing daily episodes. The qualities right. were really degrading and we're really stretching from the Ukraine theme. Mm -hmm. Similar thing happened at a much grander, more important level with China and zero COVID 2020. China, not just because um, the CCP is an authoritarian one party ruling, you know, uh, organ of government, but actually because like the, you know, East Asians in general have been much more aggressive towards pandemics in general, SARS, bird flu, things during the 2000s and 1990s and even the 2010s, they clamped down much harder than the West did and they suffered fewer deaths. And if we remember that early, let's say early September, late August, October period of 2020, before the vaccines come out, before Operation Warp Speed is successful, when people still think that Trump, let's just say like stupid statements around like the country being back and good to go in April 15, mm -hmm. people thought that had to do with his actual vaccine development response. So but when they had nothing to do with each other, Trump making silly statements actually had nothing to do with the fact that Operation Warp Speed was actually succeeding and they were going to actually hit their timelines. But back to the October, 2020, at that point, everyone's hailing China saying, look at China. Yeah. They kept their deaths down. They aren't having people, you know, in state houses doing these like protests and threatening people over lockdowns. Sorry, I remember it. You, you remember when you, yeah. you had a tweet, uh, but, but, which, cause this was amazing. You had a tweet in late fall where there was a concert, a big concert in China. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, man, like, I hate to just like say, go China, but man, I wish we could do this. Actually, that was in so, Wuhan. That's, that's, that's why. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> yes. they had a huge, it looked, it, looked, it, looked, it looked incredibly fun. Yeah. So I think the CCP got addicted to that feeling of success yeah. and the metric of we do everything we absolutely can to quote unquote, keep things open and reduce deaths to the absolute, absolute minimum. And obviously like the death levels are almost certainly not accurate as most statistics that come from the CCP are, but at least publicly facing, they're claiming that in contrast to the West, just total zero, n not yeah. near zero, but just like an incredibly small number of deaths relative to the millions in the United States. So I think it's, it's obviously about bigger things than just COVID to your point, but I think it's also just that the CCP has become addicted to the need to maintain this achievement. And because it's a non-democratic system, there are no checking forces. Like there is, there is no force in Chinese society. They could say, hey, you've gone too far. You need to check that. I think, you, see, this is why I just don't know because it's been a year of Omicron. Guys, it's November 30th. Remember last year when we were all freaking out about it? And remember everyone in New York was getting COVID and we were like, oh, actually the vaccine doesn't prevent people getting COVID. And you're like, okay, well, that kind of changed the whole narrative. They stuck to it for an entire year. And like we've had a year of circulating extraordinarily infectious levels of COVID. So, yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying makes sense, you know, three months in, but a year in like, I'm, and especially after what happened in Shanghai, Shanghai was a nightmare. Do you remember what that happened in Shanghai? Oh my God. They had like 40, 50 days of straight lockdown. Their citizens couldn't even order groceries on their phone. It was, it was her so a lot of in China, uh, a lot of them uh, order fresh vegetables online. I actually kind of familiar with this because the way it works in India, nobody really like goes to the grocery store once a week. It's a market based system in which you like get out of your house, you like turn around the corner and you go and you buy fresh vegetables at like the side place. It's more of like a daily environment. It's honestly healthy for you. Anyway, um, <laughs> what happened in India is that because it's a democratic country. So instead <laughs> of like all of that, what happened is that my grandfather was telling me this, which is with the rise of the internet, now everybody has mobile phones. You can just WhatsApp the store key, the storekeeper and they actually come to your door and, with your vegetables and then you just basically Venmo them with the Indian-based national uh, system. So in China, pretty similar actually. But people were unable to get food. Like I'm not saying people were starving, but like people were, were down to the almost nothing. There's also no frozen food culture in China. So zero COVID is wreaking havoc at the most basic level of people's lives there. And that was several months ago. So for them to stick to it, it just seems deeply, deeply beyond something. I think you might be right again. And also I want to take an opportunity to say this, which is, I think, and since this is a year, year in review, something I've been thinking a lot about is the Richard Hanania piece, which is like, actually the end of history was correct. Like actually 2022. Yeah, this is the next topic, was, so we'll, we'll yeah, transition. Good. Yeah. 2022 was a great test case for 
the alternative system to Western liberal democracy. Russia had a chance to show us that its military might, its authoritarianism, um, and good dif differential system to the West could stand up on, based on a petro economy, commit military conquest in Ukraine, and then stand tall in its own country. Clearly, that has just not happened. Like, this is the thing. Even if they win, and they win a quarter of Ukraine, was it worth, like, obviously it was not worth it. Um, is destroyed part of their economy. Their their elite is in turmoil. Finland you know, and re Sweden are in NATO versus it's more a disaster, NATO right? From a, I, I, I remember saying that the day after the invasion. I remember saying that the day after the invasion. I was like, you know, you just fulfilled your worst dream. I was like, NATO was weaker than ever in 2019. <laughs> it's like now you basically uh, excel. Like even though I think the Germans and the French are uh, useless and don't spend enough money, they still are spending more than they were. They're, I guess, less useless today than they were in 2019. Anyway, the point is that, so put Russia there. So like the Russia was one example, kind of like in a Cold War type system. Well, China was a similar one. You know, China had the zero COVID dream and then Omicron basically made that, um, Omicron basically nuked that. And over the last year, they've clung to it. Their economy and their inflation in China, again, there's no way to know. Nobody has any idea. But from what I have read, they have rolling blackouts, they have coal problems, they have uh, major tests of CCP, like basic governance, and they keep reaching for the boot and clearly, it's not working. And people shouldn't say people shouldn't take this as me saying, oh, like the Putin regime is going to fall. The Xi regime is going to fall. I don't believe that for a second. What I'm telling you, though, is that clearly they're hanging on and that's not thriving. Whereas and look, I, I'm not going to say we're thriving. But if you look at the global West, like clearly there's just a hell of a lot more resiliency built into the system. The funny thing here, because this is the you know end of history conversation, Francis Fukuyama came on the show back in May 2022 to talk about his new book. Y'all should check out that episode if you haven't seen it. But the reason why everyone's just going around with this, like, hey, maybe this end of history argument is correct is Fukuyama, you know, famously mm -hmm. has this uh, essay in 1989 that it's expanded into a book after the um, Cold War and where it's basically arguing. He doesn't argue it. You know, the, the, the basic explanation is that he doesn't say that, like, literally events don't happen. He doesn't say that everything's going to be peaceful and chill as kind of like a misstating. His point is just basically history as defined by like autocracy versus democracy, fascism versus communism versus democratic capitalism versus the mixed economy mm -hmm. is over quote unquote in the sense that, Hey, like it may actually just turn out that liberal democratic capitalism plus or minus on the capitalism side, because obviously, you know, Denmark and France and the United States and Great Britain are all capitalist countries that have varying degrees of, of socialism within them is just probably under his viewpoint going to be the most effective system of organizing a human society in comparison to its competitors. It's not the 1930s where there's an actual debate of, hey, wow, you know, maybe fascism is a better system of government. Maybe communism is a better system of government. And, you know, in 2022, to your point, Sagar, Mm -hmm. This was the year to prove it. Uh, and then there's also another concept that I really think was just completely wrecked this year, which is this idea of the multipolar world. Mm -hmm. So you've had folks for a long time as response to the disasters of the Bush years. So like, let's talk about the disaster of the Bush years. Post 9-11, it's the unipolar moment. You have people like Max Boot pretty much like calling for America to be an almost explicit, like liberal empire. This is the American hegemony era, and this is just going to be better. Who cares about the UN? Who cares about multilateral institutions? Like we're in the Pax Americana and it's going to be glorious. The, the war in Iraq is the definition of a repudiation of all of those, all of those ideals. And it's a, it's a disastrous decision that obviously the U S is going to be accountable for the rest of your and my lifetimes. Mm -hmm. But that disaster causes a, causes a bunch of people to say that we need some alternate model for organizing the world. Um, no one has any faith in the UN anymore as a like post World II institution, but they then say, instead of like this UN restraining the power of the United States, you get this multipolar world where India, China, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, like the BRICS from the 2002 Goldman Sachs report, 
where these countries are going to actually have a world that's not centered primarily in the United States, but it's going to be centered around everyone basically competing and working together and checking each other, and that will be much more stable. The 2022 revealed is that a multipolar world, a world where the United States has less quote unquote hegemony, if we think of hegemony as being this, you know, total amount of ability to do whatever it wants and impose its will, is a world where Russia invades Ukraine and then basically ruins the continent of Europe for the next several decades. Mm -hmm. And China takes Hong Kong. China threatens the world, world peace with its provocations towards Taiwan. And then it exports a model of authoritarian domestic fascism with the technology that you're referring to and those specific bits. So I think, I think it's just so interesting that we've circled around to just this most basic conclusion that, Hey, like it turns out that giving a bunch of power to like an elderly, uh, one party ruler in the case of Xi Jinping is just not a good idea. Um, Hey, it turns out that Vladimir Putin being an old guy who's obsessed with the 1980s glory days is also not a good idea either. These are obvious takes, but I think during the down points, that's difficult. There's an episode with Noah Smith that's coming out tomorrow, and I'd love to talk through a couple of the themes here. Basically, his his conception is that he, he really describes uh, the post-financial crisis era. So 2009, Barack Obama's presidency, to basically this past month with the crypto and tech crash and everything we just discussed in 2022 is just like the long 2010s. Mm -hmm. In the same way that people like talk about how the 60s didn't literally end uh, on January 1st, 1970, they basically went on through 1973, 1974 with Watergate, and then the 70s began. That's the term, the long 60s. So he's talking about the long, 20, long 2010s, and he really describes the 2010s as this period of upheaval, anger, disruption. I would love to hear, because folks will hear Noah's answer to this question tomorrow. So I'd love to hear, like, what did you learn from this 2010s period of upheaval? Well, actually, no, let me rephrase. Do you think the 2010s just ended? Do you agree with that, yes or no? And B, what did you learn from this period? I don't know. I don't think it's ended yet. Uh, I'll say, you know why? Because I think Trump is the last factor. <laughs> it's the final uh, boss. <laughs> yeah, he is. I think he's right. the final That's boss in the 2010s. Uh, yeah. Trump, I mean, if you think about it, if you're using an analogy, when did Donald Trump become a political figure? 2011, the rise of birtherism. Uh, all of that. And he announced for presidency in 2015, even though Joe Biden won, it's clearly not the Biden era. It's the Trump era. It's more about a uh, reaction to Donald Trump. So I'm not quite yet ready to say that it's over. I think it's possibly ending, although it could get a lease on life if Trump were to get reelected and back into office, which is certainly possible. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, in terms of Look, I do think we are moving away from most of the assumptions, pop culture, uh, uh, most of the most of the most basic conventional wisdom in 2011 is just like clearly not right. And I think that so again, you know, it's funny. Did you watch that John Stewart interview with Hillary Clinton and Condi? I didn't watch it. No, it's just so cringe. It's one of those things where even if you believe like defending Libya. Iraq, all of that. You would just not say it in the way and in the terms that they use. And mm -hmm. basically no matter, like again, even if you believe in the underlying policy, you would not defend it in the way that they did. Sh Sheryl Sandberg, like girl boss feminism, lean in feminism. So many just like icons of that time period are just not in any way like culturally relevant are being turned against even the culture war. It almost seems like we're going back in time. Uh, actually, today is a uh, correct way to say that. Like, what are we talking about right now? The same things that you and I talked about in the 1990s, abortion yeah. and gay marriage. Uh, it's almost been like a reversion, despite you know all the gender identity and all those other fights. So I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite sure where I fall on that spectrum. But I do definitely think that something is ending and maybe something new is beginning. But I have no idea what that's going to look like. Yeah, no, that's a... Hard to make a quite prediction of what yeah. something new looks like. And I also, well taken. I, mm -hmm. I agree with your point that you can't, much as, you know, the 1970s, in that, much as the 1960s don't end until Nixon's impeached at Watergate, if Trump loses in 2024, that would mark that's the, the end. end of the 2010s. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's actually go. good. So, yeah, I guess the 19, 
1962 to 1974 model would actually perfectly track because mm-hmm. the point is like the 50s didn't really end until JFK is assassinated. This is like the mixed Noah's Noah's point is that you know American history in terms of eras doesn't actually perfectly coincide with decades. We should treat decades as ideas rather than yeah. Than the, literal, I mean the like, 90s ended in 2001 with the dot com yep. crash. So September so, yeah, 11th. Yeah, right, exactly. exactly. That's that's yeah. that's that's exactly the right way to put it. So I'm here's what I'm fascinated by. And you you perfectly set this up with your point about Condi and uh, Hillary Clinton. I'm fascinated by figures who don't understand that a specific moment is just over and haven't adjusted accordingly. So like let's talk mm-hmm. about like Carrie Lake, um, mm-hmm. defeated Republican gubernatorial candidate in Arizona. The day before the the election, if, 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 if I think when someone tries to like write this history of this moment, like when we get our Rick Perlstein era like explanation of like of this of this decade, and you know in our in our in our twenties, I think if you could really like cite the example of someone just taking it too far as Carrie Lake. So Carrie Lake, day before the election, do you see this? She does a presser with with mm-hmm. the media, and she's telling us she's going to make their lives hell. She's like, I'm going to make the next like eight years mm. just hell for you. And I was just watching it. And look, obviously, like listeners, you, Sagar, like, you guys know my politics. Like I'm obviously like not jiving with that. But I'm just like watching this and I'm just sort of mm. neutralizing myself, just trying to look at this as like an impartial observer. I'm just like, yeah, I still think this is it. But I don't think that the majority of Arizona voters in October, November 2022 are deeply invested in Carrie Lake's like personal beef with like the Arizona Republic's like media columnist, right? Mm-hmm. We're not even talking about Trump versus the New York Times. We're not even talking about, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen versus Taylor Lorenz at the Washington Post. Like we're just talking about Arizona state politics. And like, by the way, like who even reads like state newspapers anymore? So she's just saying, I'm going to make your lives hell. And it's sort of like, that just isn't it. I, th- I think uh-huh. that's, the, that's the definition of someone bringing 2010s era discontent vibes to a period where most people are exhausted in Noah's words. And I think that's on. easy to say, though, today. It wasn't easy to say that day. I think that day, what I would have said is, Marshall, I agree. I think it's cringe. That said, inflation, the way that the polls are trending. What I always looked at it is, is that the underlying structural strength of Republicans or what should have been in the election, were giving cover to a whole lot of like batshit insanity. So I would have said like, I agree. I think it's cringe, but I don't think it would have cost her anything. Now, obviously that was wrong. And I think that that's important that it was wrong. So what can we- I, yeah. I would say to, to clarify, I still thought Kerry Lake was going to win. Like he yeah, got me on yeah. the breaking point. Right. So my, my, my point wasn't that I saw that. I was like, oh, she's going to win. Mm. I saw that though. And something just seemed off. That is kind of more what I'm talking about. I and I guess I'm now able to post stop and say, well, now in retrospect, Kerry Lake, but look, we, we know this, like Kerry Lake had a terrible like ticket splitting. There were a bunch of Republican voters who like voted for Reich treasurer, but mm-hmm. didn't vote for Kerry Lake. That's more what I'm talking about. Kerry Lake is a person who misjudged the mood of the electorate specifically to, I think your point with um, figures from this past era are still making assumptions as if it's still 2016 all over again. Yeah, you know, but, and, and that, but that's why it's hard. How do you know? Like something that's very humbling in doing this job is like, I don't have any, any idea. I didn't think Trump was going to do as well he did and he almost won the 2020 election. Then I thought that the Biden would get destroyed and then he didn't in the midterms. Something I... So here's something I enjoy about politics is like people really surprise the hell out of you. And a lot of people actually pay very close attention. So, for example, I, I think you would agree that so like Jan six rhetoric and all of that aside, there was an element to that discourse that Democrats were using, maybe not as as much, but were using in t- before the 2020 election. Right. And people just didn't buy it. But then Jan six had to happen for people to be like, no, yeah, like there's there's something there's here. some bad hombres. So, <laughs> but I think that what's important about that is that people actually pay attention. So whenever you're just like shooting rhetoric at them, they don't care. They're like, okay, like I'll make up my mind for themselves. It wasn't until they actually like not be on stand Jan six apart. Like look at Pennsylvania. 
Pennsylvania voters clearly were like, no, I'm not going to be at the center of some crazy stop and steal constitutional crisis because they said that they're going to do it. They're like, I take you seriously. I believe you whenever you say that you would challenge the election results. So I'm just not going to do it. And, you know, I think there's actually something like deeply heartening with that. I think about it, too, with uh, the 2020. So Dems genuinely thought like they knew defund the police and all that other stuff was very unpopular, but they're like, oh, but you know, Trump, like people hate Trump so much that they'll look past it. I'm like, no, like actually really almost lost you the entire election and basically uh, gave you the more, one of the most narrow House majorities up until this House majority. So, uh, but then Republicans tried to make the defund the police thing about the 2022 election. And after Dems had effectively dropped that and done mea culpas, people didn't believe it anymore because they're like, no, see, now they say, that they've learned their lesson and they actually took that seriously. So I see uh, a, an electorate that does pay attention. And actually, I'm kind of heartened by that. Like, that's, you know, they, that's a good, that's good. It matters. Mat- because if you did, like, you know, this, like, it feels like sometimes it's all just, oh, like I a, often feel a like a repeat. Matters. Yeah. But yeah, I know that that's, that, but no, that, it does right. That, that is yeah. heartening. That, that, that is, that is, you know, that, that, that is, I really believed, I believed in my, and maybe this is cynical. I was like, you know, $5 gas. Some people are just going to say, screw it. I'm going to vote for Doug. Mastriano. But like, actually, you got to give people credit. A shitload of people voted in this election and they didn't think that at all. And I was like, hey, that's nice. I like to see that. Because the secret is <laughs> you elect Doug Mastriano, you know, you're not getting any reduction in gas prices. You know, you are getting yeah, to but, your I mean, point. People are capricious. I think, this is what I think, I think, I think, yeah. I think you could know this. You could intuit, hey, you know, what, what's more likely? <laughs> Doug Mast- we, we, we elect Doug Mastriano, we repudiate mm-hmm. the Democratic establishment of Pennsylvania. What's more likely, a constitutional crisis that's not the vibe of 2024, or all of our problems are solved? Right, right. I think people got most of that rebellious energy out. And this also is encouraging, too, to your point, Sarah, because we should say hopeful things. The clear takeaway, I think if you're a political actor going into 2024, is, oh, wow, like, you actually have to show up. Mm-hmm. you actually can't just because you, you know this soccer obviously and you, you didn't I, I love like talking about inflation with you because you, you you do a good job of like articulating no here is what you could actually do here here's the actual discourse on you know gas prices oil all that type of stuff republicans did not can't make a serious national campaign yeah on reducing inflation um beyond just the superficial and the and the obvious and i hope a takeaway for republicans or basically anyone going into 24 is like no, no, like actually people are paying attention. We have to be serious for our approach. We can't just default to, they're just going to throw us this layup or, or way hardcore mixed metaphor. They're not just going to give us this layup or set up a T-ball hit for us yeah. uh, because they're not, we're not in power. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I took that away too. I'm a little skeptical of some of the economic determinist arguments, but I do think it did matter on the margins. I mean, Fetterman, like he outperformed Joe Biden and uh, he outperformed Biden and the, I forget, uh, Pat, who's out, outperformed Biden and outperformed Trump and Pat Toomey from 2016. So clearly, mm-hmm. like, something was going on. Um, was it Dr. Oz being bad? I don't know. I This is one of, again, I have no idea. Like, I'm just not going to try and take any granular takeaways. As what I found is that these are deeply complicated systems. That said, like, across the board, people clearly rejected MAGA ish type candidates, although that doesn't really mean anything. Like I, I honestly wouldn't even have even put Dr. Oz in the MAGA category. Dr. Oz was not pro stop the steal. Dr. Oz was like pretty moderate on abortion from a right wing perspective. Like, I mean, he's not Blake Masters, right? And mm-hmm. he also lost at the same margin as Blake Masters. I'm like, okay, well, you know, deep something structural is going on. There was a lot of exit poll data that said that abortion was the top issue for Pennsylvania voters. So maybe it was structural to the entire GOP. But then Ron DeSantis wins by 20 points. So you're like, okay, well, hold on a second. So anyway, if I had to guess, I think abortion was probably the single most important issue in the election, much to the chagrin of many of the pro-lifers who don't want to hear that. Um I think secondary to that was stop the steal. And I think Ross said it well. I read it on our last show. I think there is a poly crisis for the GOP. And uh, I I see no structural grappling with all of that. So like Josh Hawley, for example, like Hawley's like, we need an economic agenda for the GOP. And it's like, look, man, like it's it's not 2018. Like you can't say that every single year. Like, what does that mean? Um, And 
on some level, I sympathize. You're Party only an workers. individual center. <laughs> You're only an individual. Uh, so I'm going to give credit where it's due. Marco Rubio right now is saying that he will. I'm re- I've been really ginned up about this rail shit. It really makes me mad. These guys, like the way these real yeah, companies. Yeah, introduce, introduce the story. If folks there's a story. So, okay. So there was a prospective rail strike. Um, uh, there's something called the Railway Labor Act, which says that Congress has the ability to force a deal between railway unions and rail companies because it's of a strategic national importance to the U.S. economy and U.S. national security. The law was drafted in 1936. Okay, so the rail comp, the railway workers uh, were trying to negotiate a new deal because they basically, literally, and I'm not really not exaggerating, like do not get sick leave and they don't get days off and they often work 30 days on straight with no ability. If they get sick, they don't get paid. If they have somebody in their family died, they don't get paid. It's just, it's horrific. You can't even believe it's real. These are not struggling companies. The companies themselves have made $150 billion in stock buybacks over the last decade, which is more than they've had in capital investment, all while shrinking their labor, which is part of why part of the issue here is that they are working so hard. Okay. So uh, Joe Biden, there was a prospective strike that was coming down the pipeline. Joe Biden uh, brought the rail companies and the railway workers to the table and came up with this deal of which was then rejected by two of the major labor organizations representing workers, which set up the deal for a strike. Biden immediately came out and said, no, we're not going to do that. This would cripple the U.S. economy ahead of Christmas. We are going to force a deal um, by acting Congress under its authority from the Railway Labor Act to pass and force the previously negotiated deal. All right, so I'm setting all that up. But I just think it's wrong. Like, I, I really cannot fathom the government basically like forcing the conditions of your employment um, whenever, especially when your demands are so basic. And like on the railway, again, on the companies, like they clearly negotiate in bad faith because they know that they have a filibuster proof majority of senators who are willing to back them. And in the House, they're basically Biden and the House of Representatives, Pelosi and others are willing to just go along. And I just think it's fundamentally wrong. Like, look, this is not some like Bernie. So I'm like, I'm putting it on its most like I described it that way because that is actually what's happening. There's a great interview we've played on Breaking Point several times of Newsmax had on a railway guy. And they're like, why are you holding the economy hostage? And he's like, dude, like we don't get sick leave. And the anchor was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of messed up. He's like, he's like, that's not right. He was like shocked to learn the truth in real time. Anyway, so Marco Rubio yesterday, to his credit, I want to say, he was like, I'm not going to vote for a deal that uh, workers don't accept. He's like, if they don't accept it, I'm not going to ram this down their throat. Not something you would have seen in the year, you know, 2018 in the all the right to work stuff. Now, uh, let me try and find his exact tweet because he's still trying to square the difference. It's like Rubio, just because Congress's authority to ha- pose a heavy handed solution does not mean that it should. It's wrong for the Biden administration, which has failed to ask Congress to impose a deal that the workers themselves have rejected. Anyway, uh, I think it's look, it is one person, but John Thune actually said uh, that he's the Senate majority whip for the GOP. He said, I don't know if I have the votes to deliver because a lot of Republicans are pissed off that this is happening. That is, you know, that's a shift. I think that's interesting. What do you think of the whole situation? Wait, I just lost you. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah. comment on it just because I, I haven't followed it too too closely. I, I think the main, main well, the, I think the main takeaway is you should not pay something. Like at a basic yeah, no level, shit. yeah, right, I mean, yeah. right. Like I'm trying to, like, yeah. I, I, Obviously, I'm commenting, so it's not that I'm not going to comment, but it just seems right. pretty seems pretty straightforward. Seems there's a variety of ways you could do it. Seems like you could boost wages. Seems like there's a variety of... Most industries have figured this out, and I suggest that they uh, be encouraged to quote-unquote figure it out, especially when the government is so intertwined, to your point, about, about the 1930s. So I, I, unless there's some... I mean, look, the key thing is, like, this isn't... It's not World War III right now. It's not yeah, World War II exactly. right now. That's what I was thinking. There's a, you know, there's a reason why that a lot of the, the the Truman administration got in trouble for trying to basically like enforce mm-hmm. World War II era demands on steel workers um, during the 1940s and the early 1950s. So yeah, that's just the that's that's the that's the immediate takeaway. But no, I, I want to go back to your to your point around um, Holly and 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 just new economics because there's the there was an interesting op-ed that Sora Ramari wrote. There have been a bunch of these yeah, in the New York Times. 
arguments kind of coming from like the, the, the new right directions about the GOP needing to be more of a party of workers and, you know, corporate fat cats, all, all of the, all the obvious arguments you and I, you and I have mm -hmm. long been interested in and kind of served as the genesis for, for our work in, you know, news and politics. That's an interesting case where I think it's important to separate a policy case for something from, okay, but like what actually happened in the sense that if you read Saurabh's article, and I'll, I'll link it in the show notes, he's talking about how GOP is too associated with tax cuts, didn't do enough for working class people. I don't know. I just don't see that as being the actual issue that was actually at hand in this election. Mm -hmm. um, the actual issue in this election, and this is something with, which the new right finds itself in awkward tension around is, hey, like the GOP in a variety of battleground states was clearly deeply out of touch with the electorate. Mm -hmm. Carrie Lake was deeply out of touch with the electorate. Like Lauren Boebert almost lost because she represents a decently moderate district and she's running like she's in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. Um, she was so close to losing. Um, you have a guy like Joe Kent in Washington. Still hasn't conceded yet. They're doing a recount, but he was a person who should have won that seat, but he clearly wasn't in touch with the district. You know, in Florida, look at Florida. Like I wouldn't say that Ron DeSantis has been Mr. Reimagining GOP economics for working class base. No, like he's been focused on, I think, kind of like bigger, more culturally centric education, COVID, those sorts of issues. But he's in touch with the electorate. That's why he wins by 20 points. So I just don't see any evidence that if Carrie Lake had talked about working class GOP and screw Wall Street, she would have done any better. So that just wasn't the issue at hand. Um, Trump does well with that argument in 2015, 2016. It was what, once again, to Noah Smith's point, 2015, 2016 is defined by post-financial crisis anger. That is the debate at hand. Mm -hmm. It's the post-Tea Party moment. It's why is the economic recovery bifurcating so much? In that environment, Donald Trump and Steve Bannon come in out of the gate talking about how Jeb Bush is obsessed with tax cuts for the rich, while at the same time, Trump is going to protect Social Security and Medicare. That's a good argument. That's like a central issue. In the same way that Trump saying Jeb Bush was crazy for defending the Iraq war really mattered. But guess what? The war in Iraq, as are tax cuts on the rich, were not up for debate in 2022. And talent of politics requires understanding what's actually up for grabs. So once again, like I think there's an economic case for what the new right post-op is saying, but like actually, and this is why we should close, you know, with our final topic around with the social issues, the, you know, gay marriage vote in the, in the house that, that, that just passed out of touch, just like socio-cultural issues was far bigger. And I, and I actually put like election denial in the sociocultural I agree with category you. I agree in the with sense you. that that's just like a norms thing. Yep. Um, hey, you lose, you accept it mm -hmm. um, beyond just like the obvious court cases. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on like the gay marriage thing, the social conservatism and the general like catching before the electorate is. Yeah, I mean, I think it actually goes hand in hand, which is that you, as I also know, that some of these people who are talking about working class GOP are also, you know, it's funny. Back in the original New Right case, what I would always say is, I was like, it's you people that are out of touch with the cultural values because you're the ones pushing defund the police and all this like elite liberalism, Latinx nonsense on people who don't believe any of that. Now it's flipped though, because now, I mean, I'm not saying that they don't believe that, but at least they're hiding it better. Uh, on the right, though, they're taking positions like national abortion bans. You know this. There's a high corollary between being new right and being on for a national abortion ban. Hey, guys, guess what is literally more unpopular than defund the police? National abortion. It takes skill to actually come up with a position which is more unpopular than a national abortion ban. Now, they think like they have religious reasons for why they just don't care. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But like, don't accept that everybody in this country in a, in a secular democracy believes that. And I think people have convinced me people very seriously that they believe don't. in defining the police for a yeah, variety of reasons right. too. Like people, like people believe, Be my like, guess. I, take people, yeah. I take people at their word 
when they say what they say. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, so, but again, like, don't presume, though, that you accept that the entire, like, country is going to just go along with that. Same on election denial. Like, there's a long, there's a, there's a real strategy and thought that they're like, oh, like, you can translate it is actually deeply elitist. Like it's one of these things I know where, where you're going. I, I, they I, I really love this believe thing. that you can take Trump's like Dominion energy or Dominion Chinese ballots and be like, no, it's really about like Pennsylvania election law and mail in ballots. And like it's just not. And I think again, I would point to these election results as evidence for that. The most people don't care about mail in ballots. Now, look, they might have some questions are on the margins around automatically getting a mail-in ballot or not. But like, that's not what you're talking about. You want Trump literally wants to end all mail-in balloting, which would be a disaster for seniors, which is why I think it's ironic. A lot of seniors are very complicated on this. Now, this is the issue, though, which is that they really believe you can like trick people into thinking that you will take their anger, or, like what Trump is saying, and then channel it into something legitimate. And the point I've always made from the very beginning of which I have been ostracized is like, there is no playing footsie. Like you're either in or you're out. And I was like, I'm out. I was like, I'm not going to live in an alternative reality where the election was stolen and that a bunch of people who are just being lied to, I'm going to take that and say, yeah, you know what? This is all about Pennsylvania election law, mail-in balloting and all of this. Cause I was like, I knew it was bullshit. And I think that has been vindicated. Um, because I think people rightfully see, and I think you're right to put election denial in that it's a, it's a political valence of nothing matters and I can do whatever I want Be based. And that is something, again, I want to say I'm heartened by that. I think most Americans are like, no, you can't like, this is crazy. People are, this is also difficult for me because I don't, I don't believe in Washington's label on what a moderate is but people are moderate it's more about like what does that mean uh they don't like you know extremism really on any side and look the media will never describe like uh defund the police and all that other stuff as or maybe they will today but they wouldn't at the time as politically extreme but like it clearly was and i think people can intuit and pick up on these things and are actually very willing to parse it all out for themselves and also on the gay marriage front Look, I don't know. Um, I have tried to read a little bit into the uh, objections of the GOP senators. A lot of it comes, they they couch it all in like religious liberty, Catholic charities, and all this other stuff. I don't know. I, I genuinely have no idea uh, whether those concerns are true or not. But part of the problem for them is that just most of the country doesn't agree with them at all. Um, and they just want gay marriage to be legal. And they just really don't ever want to talk about it again. And whenever you're on that, you know, on the front of the defense, like, frankly, you've already lost. I also think it's pretty remarkable that the vote went and it was, I think it was 61, um, 39. I mean, still had 39 GOP senators who voted against it. And, you know, I think that's going to be a problem. Should you ever choose to run for president? Every single one of those people, Ron DeSantis, at the very least, he's a governor. He doesn't have to deal with it. Uh, but for a lot of these people, like, that's a very unpopular vote. and you know, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. But I think it's been vindicated of if you feel extreme, it's just an extreme in the wrong way. You know, Trump was extreme, but he was extreme in the right way uh, in terms of for the moment specifically, anger, right? Specifically <laughs> for the moment. He was extreme in the way that he he was a ball work against perceived democratic extremism in 2020. And in 2016, he was expressing the extreme feeling that the establishment genuinely was out of control and something needed to be shaken up. So where is the today's extreme, which is right? I really don't know the answer to that question. If I did, I'd run for president. So yeah, I know it's, it's, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate your point around the debate about the technical objections to the gay marriage statue. Like there are these, there, there, you know, there, there are some people on, you know, on Twitter who say like, no, like, like you said, Sagar, this is about like mm -hmm. protecting 501c3s right. and churches. But then I see a bunch of like influential conservatives, you know, like Josh Hammer, Ali mm -hmm. Beth Stuckey, like just tweeting like 
gay marriage is bad. Yeah, and right, right. I don't know how to, I mean, there's an obvious answer to this, which is the there's an advantage when you're not having to actually, you know, vote on these issues in Congress because like there, it's unclear what the actual answer is. So I think most people are going to default to, okay, non-elected Republicans are just saying the quiet part out loud. And uh, the thing, yeah, the thing yeah, that yeah. will, the thing that will, the thing that will, will, will close on is what I think Noah's most helpful framing on tomorrow's episode is going to be. And, and quick, quick note, this episode is going to, uh, make a bunch of people uh, unhappy. Noah is very acerbic and aggressive. Uh, the words stupid um, are issued quite a lot. Sagar, you know my interview style. I'm not going to invite someone into my podcast hole and be like, well, actually, I wouldn't quite use that for two point yeah. of language. Can I just say that to people? Not, just just people, shut up. This is our you know, house. Talk. Yeah, exactly. Say what you want to say. Um, but like I, that I, said, I, you like, know, can I, can I, can I tease yeah. on that? Because people criticize me for this too. I don't invite somebody on my show just to scream at them. I'm not interested in that. This know? isn't debate. This is the yeah, key exactly. Thing. It's not debate. We let people talk. If you don't, if you disagree, that's fine. I'm. It's not my job to be your voice. All right. You can think whatever you want. I think he's an interesting guy. Or you thought he was an interesting guy. We're gonna let him talk. Nobody yeah. agrees with anybody 100. percent Okay, go ahead. And, and you know, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you said because I think this is actually yeah. just like important to note because there's been this. There's been this like interesting profusion. And anyway, people can have different philosophies for different shows. Mm -hmm. And I think you're in my explicit philosophy. I think it probably comes from like our familial background mm -hmm. is that a podcast a show breaking point three, like whatever, like we've invited someone either into our home or we're going out to lunch with them. And my general approach to those situations is that those situations are just not debate. Yes. Um, debate, which we did in high school is like a very specific experience. It's also not exactly an experience that I particularly enjoy, especially over Zoom. Like, that's the key thing. Like, Kyle and I got in a pretty extensive debate about student loans at mm -hmm. the Breaking Points live show in Atlanta. I would not have that debate with him no. over Zoom. Yeah. Be a nightmare. It just is not, it's not the same experience. It doesn't work. You have to read a I've known you for freaking 12 years. Mm -hmm. And it's still kind of difficult to like read your expressions yeah. over Zoom. So yeah, I just, I want people to just listen to the episode he says something you find like uncomfortable and you're mad at me for not like correcting him. That's that. I, I think, I think fact checking can be a little important. But that's kind of a different category. Point is the most valuable thing that I hope people will listen for is his just like defining the rest of the 2020s as just like a period of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Like America is an exhausted country from all the upheaval and the chaos. And the question you should be answering yourself as either a politician or an actor in a political movement is, what am I doing in the face of that exhaustion? And what I will say, America is not seeking to get into a debate about gay marriage during a point of exhaustion. Yeah, I think that's fair. That is, that is, that is the defining reality. And look, if you are a social conservative, if you're on the new right, if you're Josh Hammer, if you're Ali Beth Stucky, like for a variety of reasons, you can, and I understand why you believe you believe about gay marriage, but you should also understand that you are almost certainly contributing to the out of touch this problem that the uh, GOP ran into. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a deep lack of comprehension. And, th and this is where like ecosystems and echo chambers come, come, come into like at a problematic level. If we put it this way, if, if the Trump era, it's actually kind of complicated too, dude, because like Democrats like won the midterms. So it's not even clear that Democrats were punished for this as much. But if an undercurrent of the Trump era and the immediate aftermath of uh, George Floyd's um, murder uh, was was Democrats overreaching on certain questions, pretty clearly 2022 was a year. The GOP took that too literally and kind of overreached. And if there's one yeah, last obviously. thing that I'll close on with like an understanding that Democrats should have about the center left, um, you know, that's the, you know, it's the, that's the ideological like household background you and I like come from. So I think I, I understand people in that space really well. Say we want about the center left. The center left doesn't make the same mistake twice. By that, I mean the center left will not campaign in Wisconsin in mm -hmm. 2016. Center left shows up in 2020. Um, and by center left, I mean like the Atlantic, Democratic establishment, like the, the Chuck Schumer. If you come from like that more like technocratic, 
college, grad school, degree places, like you learn like very specific, like lessons in like very specific ways. So understand that if you're the GOP, Democrats are not going to run on defund again within like this very specific period. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and folks should understand that. Yeah, I agree. Part of the problem for the Republicans is they can't do that because Trump is in power and he doesn't learn anything. But <laughs> you, you, you want to close on Sagar with uh, no. 2022? No, I don't think so. Uh, we'll see. It's going to be a fun year. I think it'll be, I actually think maybe this is counterintuitive. I think it's going to be a good year. I hope so. I think, I think the economy will get a little bit better. I, I hope so. I could, be, look, I could be totally wrong. I think the economy will get a little bit better. I think some balance has been restored to the force with the midterm elections. There'll be a lot of soul searching going on. I don't predict any major new legislation. And Trump, he's either going to win it or lose it this year. It's not going to be next year. It's going to be this year. He's either going to get indicted this year or not. He's either going to win the primary this year or not. I know the primaries and all that are in 2024, but I think this is the make or break year. So I think a year from now, when you and I are, are sitting together, things will actually have uh, a lot more clarity. I think on Ukraine too, I think we'll have a lot more clarity on Ukraine. I think we'll have a lot more clarity um, on China. A lot of the uncertainty and shit from this last year, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be good to go next year. That is a great place to end, Sagar. Enjoyed speaking with you on this closing your review of the realignment. All right, we'll see you guys later.